to generative AI, although generative AI has really um, accelerated the development of some of these different um, uh, AI supported assessment methods. Um, these have been around for, for longer than, um, than generative AI. So I don't know if, if anyone has um, experimented with using AI to generate assessment tasks, um, but if you have, you know, it might be worth just you know, sharing some of those ideas in the chat. Um, I've used uh, ChatGPT to generate assessment tasks where I will do things like I ask it to, um, I, I say these are the learning outcomes that I have in the module, these are the topics that we cover, can you suggest five assessment tasks that might help me to achieve these learning outcomes? And the tasks that it generates are, are really quite sophisticated. You can pick two or three and then you can drill down and ask it to give you more detail. Um, you can use AI to connect uh, students to each other, where you could say, identify students in the cohort based on their writing, um, you know, who's writing about similar things and who might benefit from being connected to each other. Uh, we're seeing examples of AI being used to score some types of assessment tasks. And I'm sure that everyone is aware of the fact that AI can be used to significantly improve students' writing. We can use AI to move from discrete to continuous assessment tasks. So AI is always on, running in the background. It can be constantly aware of students' observable behaviors and it can make more accurate inferences over time. And one of the examples where we're going to see this really explode is um, the fact that uh, ChatGPT is being built into um, you know, the next version of Microsoft Word. So already in some of the beta versions of Word, there's a little sidebar. And as you're typing in Word, there's an AI running in the background saying, I see you talking about this. Would you like me to add some of this? Would you like me to suggest some references? Um, would you like me to make your writing a little bit more academic, more formal? Um, have you thought about these three arguments that you seem to have missed out in, in your writing? So an AI is going to be running in the background, constantly observing what we're doing and making suggestions for changes. Now, if, if you think that AI isn't going to be embedded into your practice, um, I would suggest that it's going to be almost impossible avoiding it when the AI is built into every application that our students use. And what's more is we actually buy the licensing that gives our student access to that technology. So we're gonna be providing them with the tools. And if, if you think of using AI as cheating, we will be providing them with the tools to cheat. So I think we really need to fundamentally change how we think about what it is that we're trying to get our students to do. Another way that AI is going to help with assessment is that it's going to be um, provide adaptive assessment tasks. So I, I mentioned that you, um, I, the standard assessment paradigm is uniform, where all students complete the same assessment task regardless of their ability. We're going to start seeing assessment tasks that modify themselves based on students' abilities. And as students, uh, or rather as the AI learns more about individual students' capabilities and interests, it's going to suggest assessment tasks obviously in collaboration with the lecturer, but we're going to see assessment tasks that diverge. They assess the same learning outcomes, but it might provide different students with different formats for assessments where they can complete assessments in different ways based on individual preference, individual competence. And this leads us to um, assessment tasks that are more authentic. We're seeing a lot of work in simulation where AI is being used to simulate tasks that are typically perform being performed by community of practice. So, it's not going to be that much longer before I would be able to create a simulated environment where I can say to my students, you are now a physiotherapist working in a clinical, um, clinical practice. Um, we're going to put the student into that simulated environment and they're going to have to perform tasks as if they were a, um, a qualified professional. So we'll see more and more assessment that looks and feels like um, graduates are expected to behave in practice. And then the last, um, Suggestion is that AI is going to be integrated into all aspects of society. So I said before that um, language will be the, uh, the user interface for all of our technology rather than a keyboard and a mouse and a screen. Um, we'll talk to uh, computers and they'll talk to, back to us. This means that we're not going to be sitting in front of desktop computers that have uh, keyboards and mice and screens. Um, we'll be able to build computation into almost any object um, where we can just speak to objects and they'll be able to respond to us. Um, now, if this is what society is going to look like, how are we preparing our students um, through assessment tasks that prepare them for, uh, for that kind of society? So I think that, um, I think there's a lot going on um, around uh, AI and, and assessment. 
a lot more than I, I worry that the conversation that's happening around AI and assessment is really focused on this idea of making sure that students don't cheat. And I think that when you start looking at the literature and what is happening in at the cutting edge of AI supported assessment, you'll see that this is about it's far more than just making it easier for students to cheat on essays. Yes, that is possible and, and increasingly likely, um, but that is not what I think is the most important takeaway from looking at AI and assessment. Um, shifting the focus back to, to language models, which is what we can think of as the cutting edge of artificial intelligence at the moment. Um, these are some of the more recent changes that have been happening in, uh, in language models. And I'm not going to talk about this in too much technical detail, but I think they're important to, to note um, because of the, the next slide that I want to talk about. So the more recent versions of Google's BARD, uh, which is their, their chatbot and OpenAI's ChatGPT, they have what's called multimodality. So multimodality is where the language model is able to translate between media formats, which means that I can give a language model an image and it can describe to me what is going on in the image. Or I can give a text description of something that I uh, want to see and the language model will create an image um, of, of that. Now, you can imagine that this would have significant implications for things like architecture, engineering, you know, things where that visual impact um, or the, the, um, there's a visual component of what it is that you're trying to describe. Um, and there's a, a lot of interesting work that's happening between the, um, the conversation that you can have with language models where you can ask it for a description of something, or rather you can ask it for an image based on a description that you provided. It gives you a set of images. You can say that I prefer the third image that you've created. Can you make that one a little bit more structured? Can you make it a little bit more? Uh, can you provide, um, uh, well, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, data, can you append data onto the image? Um, you'll even be able to, at some point, ask the language model to perform computation on an image. So you could say, um, I see that you've got a, you know, two load bearing structures. I wanna increase the size of the building. I wanna add another floor onto the building what would I need to do to those load bearing structures um, to, to make it support the, that increased load? Um, so just kind of real time interaction with data and images, um, which I think is just going to be exceptionally powerful in, um, in, in disciplines like uh, engineering, just as an example. The, the current versions of language models are um, very broad. So I said earlier that you can have a conversation with ChatGPT about philosophy, religion, medicine, art, culture, anything that you want. We're starting to see the development of very narrowly focused models where they take a, a language model um, and then they fine tune it on a, a, a wide variety of narrowly focused customized databases. And the, the areas where I've seen the most progress in this is medicine and law. So Google's released a language model that is purely focused on a medical data. So they've taken their general, their, um, general language model and then they, they um, make it an expert in medicine. Now you can have a very high level conversation about um, medicine just through very basic uh, natural language, which I think is exceptionally powerful. Uh, another very um, interesting development that's been happening recently is what is called embeddings. And this is where you can get a, a language model and you can personalize it with private data. So, for example, I take um, I can't do this with uh, uh, with ChatGPT, um, that's um, a, a commercial company that that builds this model. But there are open source models that I can run on my laptop. So I can download the model, I can run it on my laptop, and I can give that model access to all of my private data, emails, notes, presentations, calendars, and I can then have a personal conversation through natural language with this device that has access to all of my research papers, everything I've ever published every presentation I've ever given, every email I've ever written. And you can imagine how potentially powerful that might be um, just with respect to building networks, um, you know, understanding who I've interacted with, um, identifying patterns in my, uh, um, uh, my behavior over the last five years. You might be able to funnel, um, just as an example, uh, think of the top five journals in your field and each of those journals is publishing you know once a year it's still too much for for any of us to really make sense of 
what if we could take a language model and have it look at the RSS feeds of every single journal that's publishing in our um, very narrow domain? So identify the most important ideas that have been published in the last five years. Give me a summary of each of those ideas and tell me how I can use each of those ideas in this upcoming series of, of lectures that I have planned. That's the kind of thing that we're going to be able to do with embeddings relatively soon. Uh, the next thing is plugins, where we can see that um, language models are being given um, additional skills through the use of um, uh, plugins. One of the biggest criticisms of uh, ChatGPT is uh, what's called hallucination, where it makes up sources of information. So you can say, provide, uh, give me five sources for the uh, for the series of points that you've just provided. And in the beginning, uh, ChatGPT was really good at creating plausible sources. Um, it also wasn't very good at computation and it had no internet access. And with plugins, we've seen all of these problems just evaporate. So there are computation plugins that make ChatGPT um, you know, just incredible at doing very high level maths and computation. It now has internet access through the use of plugins. Um, and we're starting to see progress um, being made on its ability to fact check its claims that are being made against uh, legitimate sources of information. So the next version of, um, of ChatGPT is going to make no mistakes when it comes to recommending sources of some of its claims about the world. And then the last thing is system messages where software developers can create personas. So you can instruct uh, different versions of language models to take on a persona of a tutor, a coach, a study guide, an assessor, a clinician, a doctor, a lawyer. Um, and so uh, we're going to see an explosion of different kinds of characters that are being created um, in assessment um, specifically. Um, and you can imagine this kind of thing where you're going to be interacting with a, um, a chatbot and it's going to be as if you're interacting with a personal tutor, except that this personal tutor will be on uh, available to you 24 seven at two o'clock in the morning. Uh, whenever you're working, you'll have access to this personal tutor, which I think is a very powerful idea. So I said I thought that those features of language models were really important. And the, the reason I think that they're really important is that when you take all of these features in combination, to my mind, they enable the creation of what I think of as highly customizable, contextually rich, personally aware characters that are high level experts in a wide range of disciplines that we can interact with through natural language. And you know, if you, if you read that again, you'll see that I've just described a lawyer, a doctor, a teacher. Um, there are very few professional disciplines that I think are not going to be replicated soon um, with these uh, different versions of, of language models. Not only that, we're already starting to see um, ecosystems of generative AI systems that interact with each other. So when ChatGPT was first launched, it didn't understand images. And now we're starting to see this multimodality where you've got language models that are very good at understanding and manipulating text, interacting with language models that are very good at understanding and manipulating images and video and audio. Um, and when these things start interacting with each other um, and they're increasingly autonomous agents, um, I think it's going to um, complicate things significantly. Um, so, for example, how does society change when every person on the planet has access to a personal physician, teacher, lawyer, accountant, when we have all of this expertise on demand? Um, and then to bring it back to this idea of assessment, how do we change assessment so that it's fit for purpose in a society where everyone in the world has access to these kinds of, of tools? Now, I recognize that, you know, some people are going to say, well, not everyone is going to have access to these tools at the moment. They're controlled by a very small group of um, you know, elite organizations. And, and I think that that will always be true. Um, not everyone in the world has internet access, for example. And yet all universities use language, um, not language, they use LMSs, uh, learning management systems. So if we're okay with ex um, insisting that our students use a learning management system, then we have to be okay with our students learning using uh, language models. We can't say that they have to have internet access for the LMS, but we, you know, somehow, you know, can't expect them to have internet access for uh, for learning models, uh, for language models. So I I, I don't have any answers. Um, I think that the world is about to get very very interesting. 
um, because of some of what we're seeing emerging um, in, in language models and AI more generally. And I, I don't have any, any specific answers. One of the things that we're trying to do in my institution is to try to develop a set of principles that we might use to support staff. Um, and, and I think the first thing that I try to tell people is that the conversation seems to be about solving the chat GPT problem. And I think that this is the wrong approach to take um, because it's limited in scope and it doesn't allow us to address some of the other problems that I identified at the beginning with the standard assessment paradigm. I think that ChatGPT can help us solve the assessment design problem. So instead of kind of closing down the conversation and trying to narrow in on ChatGPT as the problem, I think we can look at assessment design as the problem that we want to make more authentic. We want to make it more modern. We want to make our assessment more fit for purpose. And how can we use ChatGPT or language models more generally to try and solve our problems with assessment design? How can we make sure that our assessment which typically suffers from validity and reliability issues, how can we make assessment tasks more valid, more reliable, more fit for purpose? Um, so I think that uh, language models can help us address issues with assess uh, assessment that are far wider than only addressing issues with language models in assessment. I think that we can design tasks that require students to, to explicitly use ChatGPT for debate, for critical thinking, for fact-checking fact and problem solving. And this is an example of um, an assessment task that I've come up with um, for some of my students. Um, you can give the student a prompt and then they use that prompt to start a process of interaction with a language model. So this is just one example um, that, that I use, but you can take um, any potentially controversial or maybe even you know, not a controversial topic in your specific discipline you can instruct ChatGPT to take on a position in that argument, um, and you can present it with the conditions of the debate. So in this example, I've said, we're gonna go for five rounds. You will give a reason for your position. I'll give a reason for my position. We'll respond to each other's counter arguments. And then I've explicitly said, you must not converge towards my position. So this is not about trying to convince me that, um, or this is not about you trying to be convinced about my argument. Um, and the conversation that you can have with ChatGPT is phenomenal. Um, in this particular example, I believe quite strongly that the 1,000 hours requirement for clinical practice is completely unnecessary and arbitrary. And after a few rounds of ChatGPT, I actually found myself becoming convinced that I was wrong. Um, and, and so, you know, this isn't an area that I'm um, untrained in. I've given it a lot of thought. I've engaged in, you know, a professional regulatory body conversation about this thousand hours debate. And um, I thought that I was right. And yet this, this language model I found was giving very, very compelling arguments. So, so you can have a really high level conversation with ChatGPT um, in a debate format. Uh, you can tell the student to copy the transcript of the debate, paste it into a Word document, and then annotate the transcript, point out strong weak claims that both you and the language model have made. You can explore the truthfulness of claims. So typically, ChatGPT doesn't really provide evidence um, or sources. Uh, you need to provide sources for both arguments, both sides of the argument. So this it, um, it, it, um, encourages students to go out and look for material on, on both sides of the contentious um, uh, topic. Um, and I think that this is especially useful because what we tend to do is we tend to look for the evidence that supports our side of, of an argument. Um, and this is why narrative literature reviews tend not to be very robust um, and rigorous, is because we can just cherry pick, you can find a study that says anything that you want. You can cherry pick examples. When you explicitly put it into a debate format, you insist that students take um, a more evidence-based approach where they look at the evidence on both sides, and then they need to make a conclusion where they say, you know, based on the evidence, I think this. Uh, you can note errors in arguments or logic. You can identify factual inaccuracies. So. When you take something like this, this, this specific task, I think that it allows us to assess a wide variety of skills that we say we value, critical thinking, for example, um, the ability to take certain positions, to support uh, knowledge claims about the world with evidence, um, and it allows us to assess it a lot more rigorously than just asking students to write an essay, for example. So this is just one example of building in ChatGPT to an assessment task um, explicitly, you don't need to worry about the students cheating. 
you've told them that they must use ChatGPT for, for this kind of assignment. Um, in terms of an explicit faculty development framework, um, this is something that we're uh, providing with um, uh, providing lecturers in our institution with. We're talking about agency or accountability, authenticity and awareness. Um, we've taken the position and, and this was in some way informed by decisions that the American Medical Association has taken with respect to guidelines that they provided for clinicians who use artificial intelligence. Um, in that respect, they're saying that the doctor is always responsible for the outcome, regardless of whether or not the outcome was influenced by input from an AI. So what we're saying here is that the students are always responsible for the work that they submit. They can't say that the AI generated a response that was inaccurate and the students submitted the response and they got zero because everything that they wrote was incorrect. By the same token, we're saying that lecturers are responsible for their use of AI. So I don't know if any of you have experimented with this, but um, last year, uh, towards the end of the year, I was responsible for uh, running a new module that would run this year. Um, I had a module um, outline that I prepared and just as an experiment, I took the content of the module, the main topics we wanted to cover, the learning outcomes, I put it into ChatGPT and I, can, I said, generate an outline for this module that uh, consists of 20 lectures. Each lecture is an hour and a half long. Provide me with a list of contents that I should include in each of those lectures and give me three assessment tasks that would allow me to assess against these module uh, learning outcomes. And what ChatGPT gave me was probably about 70% of where I had already got to independently. And I would imagine that at this point, it's only going to be a, a lot better. So lecturers are going to start using this, um, uh, I think, significantly to become more effective and more efficient in creating content, uh, outcomes, suggestions for creative assessment tasks for, for students. Um, but the lecturer is always responsible for, for what they create, regardless of whether or not they use AI. Um, we need to provide guidelines for decision making. Um, so what we're trying to do is try to provide uh, try to provide support for um, for faculty at the university, and to say these are some of the ways that you might want to think about using the technology. These are some of the things that you probably don't want to use the technology for. Um, so you know it, that's difficult because it's a moving target. It's changing almost on a weekly basis. Um, it's really hard to keep up with some of the changes that are being made but we're trying to provide at least some guidelines for, for faculty. Some of the ways that you might want to think about making the students work more authentic, if you are going to allow for the use of language models as part of the assessment task, is to link it to personal experiences. So we say that students should always be doing work that's linked to their lived experience. Um, this requires them to take um, what ChatGPT provides and to integrate it with what they're experiencing as part of um, uh, their kind of practice work, uh, just as an example. So I might ask students to reflect on their um, experiences in clinical practice, maybe an ethical dilemma that they've experienced with a patient, and then to use the language model to work through the ethical dilemma. Um, so rather than have a conversation with a, a clinician who students don't always have access to, um, you can imagine, and and if I'm honest, a lot of clinicians have uh, suspect ethical, um, uh, um, I guess, decision-making frameworks. Um, so you can ask the students to engage in a conversation with ChatGPT about how to work through an ethical dilemma that the student has experienced in practice. So that might be a way that you might want to um, get the student to, to use ChatGPT, but to link it to their own personal experience. And then I think we always want to get students to explain how they used the, the AI. What is the impact of the AI on their thinking, um, on their decision-making? Um, I think including that in um, an assessment task is always useful. And if we think about an AI as just another person in the student's learning network, it kind of makes sense. I want my students to speak to lecturers. I want my students to speak to clinicians. I want them to speak to patients. Maybe now I'm just saying that I want them to speak to an AI. So it's not about using the AI to cheat. It's about using the AI to support the students learning around an experience that they've had in practice, which is meaningful. And I think that this can be very, a very powerful learning experience. I think it's especially important that we talk to students and faculty about how the AI is going to become invisible. When 
I mean, I, I don't know, you know how many people are familiar with this. Maybe this is obvious to everyone. Search that you've ever done in Google. Um, so every time you search for something in, in Google or, or in Bing, you've been using AI um, for the last 10 years. Um, Google Maps relies on AI. Um, but as AI becomes more integrated in society, it becomes more and more invisible. And we tend not to think of it as artificial intelligence. Very few people think of search as the implementation of artificial intelligence. And as this becomes more integrated into our technology and our society, it's going to become more invisible, which means that we have increased capacity to use AI unknowingly. And this is one of the problems that I had with our institutional response. Our early response to AI is that they talked about the unauthorized use of AI. Um, this is problematic because most people are using AI for many tasks and they don't even realize it. What happens when your operating system makes a suggestion? So your, your Windows operating system or Mac or Linux, what happens when Word starts making suggestions and you don't think of that as AI? Is that unauthorized use? And we start getting into this um, the semantic game where we're having to um, increasingly come up with operational definitions of what um, unauthorized use means. And this becomes more and more difficult as the AI becomes more and more invisible. So I think it is our responsibility to understand, but it's also our students' responsibility to understand. So we need to build awareness of artificial intelligence and how it is impacting um, our decision making. So some of the implications of AI supported assessment. What I worry about is the potential movement of accountability from teachers to software developers. So for example, when Blackboard or Canvas or Moodle or any of our learning management systems, what happens when they start building AI into their products? And we start outsourcing decision-making around the curriculum and pedagogy and assessment to someone who's building a piece of software in another country that may not be familiar with our unique context. Um, obviously, most of my teaching experience has been in South Africa. I know the problems that might arise when there's a software developer in Silicon Valley in California who's making decisions about pedagogy that are going to affect decisions that I can make with my students. So I do worry that we're going to see this movement of accountability where teachers kind of put up their hands and say, it wasn't me, like the software made this decision. Um, and so I think we need to maintain accountability and responsibility as teachers. I do worry that there's going to be a change to the pedagogic relationship where um, as AI becomes more involved in assessment tasks, we may want to hand over more and more of that responsibility to an AI. There's great research that is coming out at the moment where we're actually seeing that students prefer the feedback that's being given by um, artificial intelligence systems. So the AI is able to provide more consistent feedback across the whole cohort, um, more detailed feedback. It's able to uh, provide it in a language that students prefer. Um, and so, you know, I, I start to worry because if it gets to a point where the student's learning is improved by the feedback that they get from an AI, I think that I will have a moral responsibility to hand off more of that feedback responsibility to the AI. But then there are relationships that I get, that I build with students through the feedback now, what happens when that relationship disappears because an AI is doing more and more of, of that work? So there are pedagogical relationships that are around, they're kind of around assessment, but they're not exactly related to assessment. And I worry that some of that relationship um, is affected when we distance ourselves from, from the assessment, which is what will probably happen, um, if I'm honest. As AI gets better at assessing our students, are we going to hand off some of that responsibility and are we then going to become more and more removed from the, from the interaction with the students? And I, I do worry about that. We are going to see increased surveillance, not only of student behavior, if I'm honest, we're going to see increased surveillance of everyone's behavior. Um, so for example, um, I'm not sure what, uh, what um, back end the, the university uses over there, but uh, at my institution, we use Microsoft. So if you could be a Google university, we're, we're a Microsoft university. Microsoft is already building AI into um, the uh, uh, Outlook, um, Word, uh, Calendar. And so my university is going to be able to generate very detailed graphs and kind of behavioral patterns based on, maybe it's anonymized, um, but they're going to be able to identify you know, working patterns and working behavior for faculty. 
you know, how long are you spending in Word? How long are you spending in email? Do we need to include this in our next conversation with the line manager? And um, we're going to see this surveillance happening across all aspects of higher education. Focused on students, we're going to we're going to talk about supporting student learning, but the fact is something is going to be watching students' behavior all the time. Um, I think that adding AI supported assessment practices is going to introduce new challenges. So I, I believe that it will solve some of our oldest challenges in assessment, but I also believe it's going to introduce new, new problems. Um, however, we may find that if inference of learning by, by, by AI is more accurate and defensible, I don't see a solution that doesn't see us handing over more and more of our responsibility as teachers to the AI. So, if people start doing research showing that AI better supports student learning than teachers, what becomes of us? Uh, you know, what is the role of a teacher when it turns out, if it turns out that an AI is better at teaching than we are? So I raise these questions not in an alarmist way, um, but just to suggest that I think it's useful for us to think about these things, to understand where the technology is taking us. Do we have a role in, in mediating that direction? Um, should we be contributing to that conversation? Or is the conversation being driven at the moment by a group of Silicon Valley elites in California who are making decisions that are going to significantly affect um, higher education and, and, and pedagogy? So I'm, I'm not sure if, if that um, makes people feel more nervous, more afraid, or I don't know, maybe more optimistic about the future. Um, and the, the last point I, I wanted to mention was just that I've, I know that I focused on assessment, um, but I think that the true potential for AI is uh, in supporting student learning. So I think that I've mentioned some examples of how I think AI would support student learning, but also I think learning by lecturers. I think if I think of my own practice as a teacher, as a researcher, as someone interested in some of these ideas, my learning has been accelerated by my use of AI. And I would like to think that I can help my students become more effective learners and better disciplinary experts in their own use of AI. So I think that we have an opportunity now to enhance our own practice as teachers. I think that we can become more efficient and effective. And I think that the combination of me plus AI plus my student plus AI will lead to better outcomes. And I mean better outcomes in a disciplinary perspective. So when I graduate a nurse or a physiotherapist or a speech and language therapist or an occupational therapist, I think that if I use AI as part of my teaching while that student uses AI as part of their learning, I think ultimately we will see better patient outcomes. That's what I care about. I don't really care about the student's ability to do well on my assessment tasks. The only outcome that I really care about as someone working in health and social care is that physiotherapists, OTs, nurses, doctors, I want them to be able to produce better outcomes in their patients. That's the only thing that really matters. And if I can use AI and help my students learn and use AI to produce better patient outcomes, that really is the only metric that, that should be uh, driving my decision making. So that, that's uh, everything that I have to say, colleagues. I hope that some of it was, was useful and, and maybe even interesting. Um, I, I'd really uh, like to hear some of your own thoughts on, on some of this. I, I've heard the chat coming in. I haven't had a chance to look at them, but uh, maybe that's something that uh, we, could, we could talk about now. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. I think um, this has been a really insightful and, and useful um, approach and, and um, focus on assessment because I think that is really where um, almost the fear stems from in terms of plagiarism and um, the conversation centering around what tool to use to limit plagiarism etc and I think what's come out from this discussion and your presentation is that we actually need to use um, AI and not veer away from it. Um, and just I, uh, my experience, I developed a, just a, a very brief um, framework for the faculty on ChatGPT, and I used ChatGPT, and it was a, it was such fun just to type in a topic, and uh, most of the document comes from ChatGPT itself. Obviously, I edited before I, I shared it with faculty. 
um, but it really is a wonderful um, tool to use. And I think what we're taking, what I'm certainly taking away from this is how we need to educate ourselves around AI and how to embed it in what we do. Um, I have a few questions, but I'm just going to leave it open to um, anyone who'd like to ask a question before we go to the chat. Um, please, colleagues, please unmute and ask your question or give your comment. I think this is a really lovely conversation to be having at this point in time. Um, so I'll leave it open to you. Would anybody like to, to ask a question or to comment? Anything that you would like to add? Understand. Sorry, I'm working my way through some of the uh, the, the chat and things. Okay. Um, um, is there anything? I think um, Mr. Wilson Trollope, would you like to comment on AI in numeracy? Because I had a question on AI in numeracy because um, the focus is mainly on qualitative and textual analysis. Um, so I don't know if you have anything to comment, uh, Prof. Rowe, on how to use um, AI for numerical related subjects before we ask um, Mr. Wilson Trollope to comment. Um, so I, I made a comment, uh, I responded to, to one of the comments, I don't know if it was in, in response to, to the colleague who asked the question, but um, the Wolfram Alpha is a, a platform that you use that just has incredible computational ability. And Wolfram Alpha plugin was one of the first plugins released for ChatGPT. So it, it adds a level of computational ability to ChatGPT that far exceeds any other platform that we have available. Um, so I think in terms of numerical computation, um, we, we, you know, th that, that game is over. Um, you can speak to ChatGPT using natural language. You don't need to know anything about mathematics and the computation that it does in the background is, you know, it far exceeds what, what most human beings are capable of. Um, thank you. I think, um, Dr. Kylie, your comment about important to understand GAI, would you like to expound on that? Yes, I think it's more important, um, as Prof stated, about understanding what generative AI is. we all stuck in what chat GTP and we, um, everyone's got like, because in a lot about chat GTP, models out there that are doing the same or similar things and they be, they're coming out every day. Um, and as was pointed out, for example, that um, if you're not using chat GTP, your um, turn it in is worthless. I, I can, you can go onto YouTube and watch a hundred videos on how to um, skip the plagiarism process. Um, it's no art. There, there's as quick as they develop something, um, and that's where I see the, I said it's a tipping point because as quickly as you put something out there, there's already a hack to overcome that thing. And it's, there's no um, real skill in finding the hacks these days. So I think it's more important to understand what generative AI is as opposed to understanding chat GPT. Because chat, chat GPT, while it is the main language model at the moment, um, the model's been developed all around it. So as you mentioned, BARD and um, what's that? But those are just the big ones and there's small ones that are happening and improving the whole time. And um, oh, I can't remember the name now, but the Microsoft just developed a model that actually is smaller than ChatGPT, but better than ChatGPT because it uses Chat GPT's decisions as opposed to its database. So it's, you know, you need to understand what we're working with as opposed to understand one tool within the broader context. That would be my comment. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Prof. Rowe, would you like to respond? Yeah, I, I agree 100%. Um, to focus on Chat GPT is to really miss the point. Um, there are, um, I don't know, the last time I looked, there were something like 20, 20 notable language models. Um, they're being produced by Facebook, NVIDIA, um, Adobe. Uh, basically, this, this, is, this is the train that everyone is getting on. And so any company that has the, um, the, the scope, the data, the budget, 
they're all building their own language models. And that is excluding the ones that are open source, that are being available, being made available for, for research communities. Um, we've seen customized version of language models. So Google's language model is called Palm. Um, they've, they've been uh, creating uh, MedPalm, which is the, the medical version of, of that language model. So like trying to kind of corral these things and, you know, trying to, I don't know, ban them, um, is a, is a fool's errand and um, there is no way that we're going to be able to control this it'll be like oxygen it's just it will be everywhere built into everything this will be built into your phone your car at some point this will be built into your fridge and your toaster i mean that that is the direction that that this field is is moving so to think that we're going to somehow control students use of this is is going to be a, um, a waste of time we really, in, in my opinion, I'm, I'm willing to accept that there are different approaches to this and, and people will agree with me, uh, disagree with me, I, I, I get that. But in my opinion, we should be trying to teach our students how to use as many different language models as possible to use it so that they can accelerate their learning. That's, for, for me, that's the only thing that matters. I want my students to be better than everyone else's students. Uh, and I, maybe that's not... Maybe that's not a politically correct thing to say, but when my students graduate and they're sitting down in an interview with, uh, you know, other students in, in, you know, our context back home, I, I was at UWC, I was constantly thinking, when my student is interviewing next to a student from UCT and Stellenbosch, how do I make sure that my student stands out more? And I, I genuinely believe that if we're not doing that with language models, we are placing our students at a significant disadvantage. I think that that may be controversial. I, I get that people may not agree with me, but that that's how I see it. Um, yeah, I, I think um, you you are quite correct in terms of the fact that this is going to be so immersive in everything that we do and everything that uh, all our life life activities. In fact, um, there's a question here in, in the chat. There's an argument that those responsible for developing AI are concerned about maximizing profit. A uh, question is, how can these companies be regulated so that there's a responsible use of AI, especially in educational settings? Um, I was trying to look for the an, an article, a link to an article. Um, so the in in the in the US there was recently a congressional hearing where um, some high level academics and the, the CEO of OpenAI were invited to comment to Congress. Um, and what was interesting is that they were asking Congress um, the US government to regulate them, um, which is unheard of. It's unheard of for companies um, to want more regulation, especially in this in the kind of high tech. Um, sector. Um, so I think it's telling that companies who are building AI are asking for regulation um, to make sure that they are, um, I don't know, being guided towards, I don't know, better um, or socially beneficial uses of AI. So I, I see the comment that you, you can't regulate things. Um, you, you can regulate companies, though, um, so the, the products that companies produce can be regulated. But you're right in the sense that you know, language models are never going to be um, controlled now, especially with open source language models where anyone can get hold of them and, and use them for anything. But anybody wanting to build a company has to conform to, to regulation. Um, so th that's you know, one way to, to think about it. Thanks. Um, so I see, um, Mr. Wilson Trollope, would you like to give some information there in terms of who owns the intellectual property rights to what and for what? To what and for what? Yeah, hopefully you can you can hear me. I've just got it just by way of introduction. Um, yeah, well, broadly speaking, um, it's very clear that intellectual ability on its own is going to be insufficient for surviving into into the 21st century. And um, there are certain skills, in my opinion, like digital literacy, literacy, problem solving, reasoning, critical critical thinking, teamwork and communication and et cetera, that that are going to play a vital role. And why I say that before I come on to intellectual property rights is because uh, for the last since 
2019, I've worked with um, and implemented a system by McGraw-Hill called Connect that um, speaks to exactly what you're talking about in terms of, of artificial intelligence um, and, and imminently trying to work through a study on that. So the, the question I'm raising um, around intellectual property rights centers around you've got this these large learning sort of uh, models or modules like for example chat gpt which is only one but i'm fascinated to know now when you historically or previously had authors writing literature you've now got access to information that is in the, in, in 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 open open I mean it's open to everybody so your role of the author could significantly be changed your role of the your traditional uh, publishers like Oxford and McGraw and Pearson's and all these sort of people that they've got to be it's going to be interesting to see who and how the issue of writing and research um, is going to evolve and who owns that um, in terms of intellectual property rights. So so I'll, I'll, outside of this, Prof, I'll make contact with you and share with what I'm busy doing um, because it, it could be a, of, of fascination. So that's really what I wanted to say. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if you've, if you've, you've seen, I've just added a link into the chat. We're already seeing books being sold on Amazon where all the illustration is done by generative AI. Um, all the text is generated by um, AI. And the authors are just, you know, editing, editing the documents. Now, I, I don't know how good the books are, um, but they are being sold. Um, so in those in those contexts, the author is the person, the, the author that everyone recognizes is the person who's using the AI um, to, to generate some of that content. Um, I think the, the more difficult question is the fact that the language models are trained on existing content. And this is a, a massive issue at the moment in art, where the, um, the image generating language models have all been trained on art that is on the internet. Um, and the authors, the authors, the creators of that art, their intellectual property has been used to train the language models, but they are not recognized in any way. Um, and so uh, copyright law has no way to actually um, deal with this issue because we've never been in a situation where anything other than a human being was able to generate content. So all of our law, our intellectual property law, it, it relies on an understanding that it is a human being who is copying the work of someone else. Um, in these models, it's not copying the work of someone else. It's trained on the work of someone else. Um, that question, can you copyright style? That's exactly what the, um, the, the owners of these image generating language models are saying, that if a language model creates a piece of art in the style of another artist, you know, is that really copyright, uh, copyrightable? Um, and so that, that's exactly the argument that they're having. But copyright law has no way of actually dealing with any of this. And so it's, it's causing massive problems especially in, um, in, in image generation. Um, I don't have any answers to that, but uh, that, that's kind of what I was alluding to earlier on in the presentation. This is going to change everything. Um, this is going to touch everything. Everything that we care about is going to be imbued with intelligence. Um, and our interaction with that, with these artifacts is going to be through natural language. Um, I, I don't see any part of society that isn't going to have to adapt um, to, to this new reality. And it's going to be painful and difficult. Um, I think that there will be people who lose work. We've already seen examples in the US of people being laid off and being replaced by AI. I, I don't see that slowing down. Um, so I don't, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is, um, uh, but I think it's an interesting conversation. Thank you. Um, colleagues, any other comments or questions that you have at this point in time to add to the discussion and the debate on assessments and AI? 
Um, so, so I have a question while someone else is still waiting. You know, you, you mentioned about the fact that um, AI can modify assessments um, and uh, um, AI is about getting is about more than getting students to not cheat. But um, we know that many of our students really don't want to think for themselves. Um, and, and I think, you know, so how do we get students to to actually learn and not just copy from um, copy text and present that as their own, even if it's um, even if you're asking students to to uh, evaluate um, a text for correctness or a text for content, they could well ask ChatGPT to to evaluate that text and give you what ChatGPT or any other um, app might might ask them or that they might be using might give them. So they're in fact giving what the AI tool is presenting and what learning is happening. That's what I'm asking. Uh, yeah, I agree with you. Uh, I would say that in some respects, there's nothing new yet. There are always students who don't want to learn, who want to take the path of least resistance. They want to get the highest mark for the least effort. Um, I've always thought of students as being cost benefit machines. They're always evaluating the cost of having to do the work against the, the benefits of, of doing the work and, um, you know, trying to um, struggle with their tension. You know, do I come to the lecture? If I come to the lecture, and don't go to the beach, then, you know, I might get a low mark, but I might be willing to give up that extra mark because now I can go to the beach. Students are doing this kind of evaluation all the time. So from that point of view, there's there's nothing new, um, you know, and I would say that that's a human trait, not a not a student trait. Many of us would take the path of least resistance um, if given the opportunity. I think we've always been faced with this challenge, and the most recent version of this is essay mills where students have been able to pay someone else to write their essays. Um, so th that, that's not new, being able to submit work that's been generated by um, someone else. In this case, it's just something else, and it's free. Um, so the scale that this can be done at um, is, is far greater than and the speed at, that this can be done at. And, and this is why I was trying to really take pains to um, emphasize the importance of the pedagogical relationship that we have with students. Um, I don't think of my role as trying to catch the students who want to cheat. I think of my role as trying to build students who have no interest in cheating. Um, and, and I think that how we emphasize that is says a lot about where we spend our time. So I want students to use AI in a way that's going to enhance their learning. And that's going to be the focus of my conversation with students. What I don't want to do is spend all my time trying to make sure that I can catch the few students who do cheat. Um, some students will cheat and they'll slip through the net. But I don't want to spend 80% of my time trying to make sure that I catch the two students who want to cheat. How do I make sure that there's 98% of the students who have no interest in cheating? Mm. How do I make sure that those students are going to be best supported? And I want to accelerate their learning. Um, and so... I think that this relationship that we have with students, I think, is exceptionally important. And at the moment, I don't see that as being something that an AI can replace. So I like to think that the time I spend with students in the classroom helps them understand how putting in the cognitive effort, doing the work, going the extra mile, how do these things accumulate over the next 20 years of their lives so that in 20 years' time, they're at the top of their field? That's the conversation that, that I want to have with students. Mm. I don't know if that's a satisfying answer, but that's the only you one know, that I uh, Thank you. Um, and, and I think the, the distinction needs to be made between cheat and learn. And, and my question was, how do we get students to learn and not really to copy what's out there already? Where, where's the learning happening? Um, because they can easily submit something on paper that's not their own. Um, but then what's the point of being in higher education? And what are they walking away with at the end of the day? But but again, it all comes down to how we use the tool and how what we ask students to do with the tool. Um, and, and that's where the learning happens. So coming from a learning and teaching perspective, I'm, I'm asking myself, how do we support faculty to use AI as a, as a teaching tool for learning? 
and and I'm trying to get my head around that. Um, and so that was the that was the the thinking behind the question. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Um, and and that's something that I've struggled with for for a while, um, because I thought you know I write a lot and I use writing as a way to come to a better understanding. It's the writing that helps me think better. If something else is doing the writing, then I'm not improving my thinking. And and so that was when I realized like, oh, wait a second, the, the process of me writing is what matters, not the output. And so I almost don't care about the output, but I have to go through the difficult cognitive work of grappling with ideas because I'm the product of the writing process, not the, not the piece of written work. And so when I talk to students, I try to make that distinction. It's in the cognitive effort that they engage in that develops their own thinking. The output is almost irrelevant. We use the output as a way of trying to make an inference about students' thinking. And I think what AI does is it helps us kind of circumvent that a little bit, where it's the thinking process that can become more transparent and more open rather than the output. If the output can be generated by an AI, I almost stop caring about the output. What I really want to see more of is the process that the student is going through. I can see how much cognitive effort they're putting into the process now a little bit more effectively than I used to be able to. Um, and it was my own grappling with this idea of, you know, I write a lot of blog posts. If an AI can write all of my blog posts, well, you know, then what? Should I just stop writing blog posts? And then I realized, no, the reason I write the blog posts is not because I care who reads my blog posts. I write the blog posts so that I can understand things more clearly. So I need to keep writing because I'm the product, not the not the blog post. I don't know if mm -hmm. that makes sense. And, and I try to have that conversation with students and, and see if you know maybe it makes sense to them as well. Mm, thank you. Um, I'm going to allow, allow and ask for any further last questions or comments that any of the um, attendees might have at this point. Um, yeah, it also relates to instructional design principles through the alignment of the outcome with the relevant technological tool. True. Um, and, and I think, um, you know, outside of this, I certainly would like to have a conversation with you around how to support faculty to use um, AI tools as part of, of the learning, um, teaching and, and learning as well, because I think you know, that would also allay any fears of seeing ChatGPT as the thing that needs to be managed um, by staff. Um, so, uh, yeah, I don't know if uh, I just have one the last question about master's and doctoral thesis. So how do you deal with that? Because short questions and evaluating ChatGPT's um, responses, that can work. But how does one deal with master's and doctoral theses in terms of um, extrapolating chunks from an AI tool? It's interesting that you mentioned that. I've, I've got an email sitting in my inbox from a colleague asking that exact question. How, how do we deal with uh, PhD and master's level work? Um, and I don't know, I, I'm struggling. I'm struggling with it because on the one hand I'm saying, yeah, it's fine. My, my undergraduate students can use AI to generate content. You know, what matters is the learning. But I'm not comfortable saying that a PhD student can generate a thesis. Um, and, and I don't, for myself, I haven't identified why those two things feel very different. Um, from, a, from an assessment point of view, we've got the Viva um, at, the, at the PhD level. So, you know, you can generate as much content as you want. Um, but when you have to you know, stand in front of a panel and and have an hour and a half conversation about your work. I think that mitigates the risk of, of students generating their theses. But I can't answer the question of why an undergraduate generating content is different to a PhD. But I know that I feel differently about those two different use cases. So I, I don't have an answer yet. I'm struggling a lot with, with that question at the moment. Okay, I think Prof Naika is going to give us an answer. Thank you, Prof Naika. <laughs> okay, um, if I give the answer, I'll have to patent it and make a lot of money, but okay, <laughs> that will come. My question to you, sir, is, um, so now I was with ChatGPT and AI creating all this wonderful stuff. 
How does it affect academics now that once you write articles, that suddenly you find someone that was dormant for two years and now in the next two years, he's written 50 articles and there's no way of them checking out whether this AI generated or not. How would journals then also determine that this is uh, written by a person and not a, a chat GPT or AI? Have you looked around those lines? So until quite recently, I, I was an editor of a journal, um, physiotherapy education journal, and I've, I've been on, on various levels of, of uh, um, the journal editorial workflow and, and process. Um, and, and I know that this is something that journals are struggling with at the moment. Um, I know that some journals have taken the position that they won't accept um, any articles with AI-generated content in it. How they're enforcing that, I have no idea because it's very difficult. I guess in some ways it's no different to accepting and publishing papers with fabricated data. Um, to some extent, you, you make your position as a journal um, uh, evident. You say that we don't accept these kinds of papers. And any papers that are submitted that are that include this kind of content, we, we retract. Um, but it's very difficult to determine whether or not an author has fabricated data. Um, so, you know, even when they submit, um, you know, data sets to open data repositories, who's going to go trawling through all of that data to find the, the, the flaws in the data, the, the fact that it's fabricated? So I, I know that journals are, are struggling with this. Um, you, you, I think at some point we'll see um, AI that is observing patterns of behavior. And if someone who's not been publishing all of a sudden starts publishing at a much higher rate, much higher level, um, you know, there's a, there's a progression that we can see in, in human publications. I know that my first articles were really bad. Um, you know, some might say that my current articles are really bad as well. Um, but I like to think that there's been some progress. Um, so I, I think you're right. The, it's going to be very difficult. It's going to be very problematic. You're going to see some people pushed by publication pressures, promotion pressures, um, and it's going to be very hard to resist the urge to, you know, improve improve your your um, articles. Uh, I don't have a good answer. I know that journals are, are really working hard on this. Elsevier is, you know, one of the richest companies in the world. I'm sure that they are throwing an enormous amount of resources at trying to figure out these problems. I don't know how I feel about Elsevier being the solution to the problem, though. Thank you. Um, so, you know, I, I think I know that there might be one or two people who might have a question. Um, I don't see any hands or I don't see anything else in the chat. Um, before Dr. Williams um, closes, uh, just to let everyone know, I cold called Prof. Rowe and just said, I heard you did a presentation <laughs> for Alta, so would you please do a presentation in the faculty? And you just kindly um, acquiesced and acceded to our request. So thank you so much for um, really being willing to share your knowledge and thoughts with us and, and being so willing in to just say yes via mail. But I hand over to Dr. Williams. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Professor Rowe. Um, just like Desiree said, um, you know, taking time out of your busy schedule and just coming here and sharing your expertise and your insights with us, it's much appreciated. And certainly if I listen to the conversation, we'd most probably sit, be sitting here for days because this topic is so current, it's so relevant, and certainly in our context, it's necessary for us to, to speak to it and have a conversation. But I also just want to take... Um, us back to your possibly one of your first lines where you said to, for you it's not about the positive or the negative but how it works how AI, AI works and it impacts um, on our lives and I certainly take that on board I also appreciate the fact that um, the context of AI that you focused on was assessments and that is certainly what we are about because we obviously always um, checking and evaluating whether our students learn and how much they have learned. And certainly if we look at AI and, and the development thereof, it has to be a shift for us in how we assess. So um, thank you for, for focusing on assessments. Um, you've certainly introduced very many new concepts to me and for many of our um, colleagues here. It was really about st your presentation stimulated a further probing into AI and how AI impacts on what we do and how we engage with our students. 
for me, the uh, aha moment was when you said um, it is not, we should not assess to address the problems of chat GPT, but we should address AI to solve our assessment design. And that to me is really a shift in the way that we need to think about AI. And as you said, ultimately, the responsibility is ours and it stays with ours as to, um, to ensure that our assessments are fit for purpose, that they are modern, that they are uh, more reliable and that they are more valid. And I, valid, and I appreciate um, that you shared those insights with us. And certainly we don't have a choice. It's here, it's now. We have to embrace the change. And this is certainly change. And for many of us, we've been at this for so long and it's difficult to change because we still want to do what we've do, done for so many years. However, it is important that we continue this conversation. It's important that we continue debating, that we actually do debate um, and debate the influence of AI on what we do and how we engage with our students and how we um, practice and how we change those practices. Um, if we don't do it, we will become irrelevant and we will certainly be left behind. And it's not just us, it's our students. So as you say, we need to work to get the best students and to get the best students out there so that they can uh, be successful in the wor uh, world out there. So Professor Rao, Thank you so much. It is much appreciated. Um, and colleagues, once again, thank you for being here this afternoon. Um, Professor Scholes, I don't know whether Professor Nyka Sandy is still up, but I yield yeah. to you. We'll give Professor Nyka the last <laughs> word. <laughs> Prof Nyka, go ahead. Um, sorry, uh, Prof. I just remembered last week I attended a, a, a conference, an international conference regarding the master's and doctoral um, dissertations. And what we're talking about is to get away from the full dissertation and move more towards cause based because AI has got a flaw that it cannot interpret statistical analysis uh, to the T. So the, what they are saying is they want to have more um, um, course work and more less of a literature review, more of findings and more of statistical analysis. And over and above that, they want students now to start defending their masters and doctoral students to ensure that that is their own work. So they would say 60 to 80 percent now will be more coursework orientated. So I just thought I just remember that, and I just thought let me just add, um, inform you on that as well. Thank you, Chairperson. That's lovely. That's thank you for sharing that with us at the end of the presentation. Um, colleagues, have a wonderful afternoon. Further, Prof. Rowe, you probably, I see you nice and airy there. We are sitting in Cape Town. It's cold, it's wet. And um, so we're trying to stay warm and snug. And uh, so, colleagues, have a wonderful afternoon. All the best for your uh, marking. I hope that it's going well. And Prof. Rowe, again, a, a big thank you to you. And um, uh, we'll be in touch with you regarding how we can take this further in our faculty if that's in order for you to support us on this journey. Oh, thank you very much for the for the invitation and for the kind words. I really appreciate it. And having having lived across the way from CPUT in Belleville, um, uh, I've, I always have time for for CPUT and and for for colleagues back home. So anytime, I'm I'm happy to to continue the conversation. Okay, and thanks, and all the best for your endeavours, whatever you're doing over there at the University of Lincoln. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, bye-bye, bye-bye. Bye-bye.